Hi, my name is Sarah. Today I'm going to be leading you guys through six different sites that are really important to the university and are reflective of the black slash Af the black and African American experience here at the University of Georgia. So the first stop on our tour today here, we are at the Arch, as you can see. Has anyone been to the Arch before or seen pictures of the Arch? Yeah, so it's most likely you've seen the arch before, or if you've at least heard of the arch, if you know anything about the university, the arch is probably one of the most prominent symbols associated with the university, obviously besides our football team. The arch is very representative of the academic side of our university. The arch was first installed with an iron fence surrounding North Campus in 1857, and the arch and the fence that it was attached to acted as a barrier between the university and the rest of um, the Athens community. The arch was actually built by the Athens Foundry, which was owned in part by William Talmadge, who was a very successful northern-born blacksmith and he was a slave owner, so it is most likely that we can assume that enslaved labor was used at the factory where the um, fence and the arch were built and most likely were used in the installation of the arch as well. Besides the arch being a academic symbol for a university, um, the arch is also a symbol and site of protest for a lot of people in the, for a lot of students at the university and a lot of people within the Athens community. The arch's three pillars stand for wisdom, justice, and moderation, and a lot of people see these as very important values and are representative of reasons why to protest, you know, to protest acts of injustice, and if the university stands for justice and moderation and wisdom, then we should protest for injustices we see in the world, and the perfect place to do that is at the arch. The very first protest that occurred at the Arch was in 1866-1867, around that time, which is after emancipation, post-Civil War, and Black Athenians gathered there to protest their exclusion as students from the University of Georgia. So these Black Athenians, they saw this university and they were now no longer enslaved people and they felt that they deserved the opportunity to have an education at the University of Georgia, just as much as the white Athenians and white Georgians did. And unfortunately, at this time, the university was not, um, the university remained segregated. And these, when these black Athenians went to protest at the side of the arch, they were surrounded by armed white students and white townspeople. And the future chancellor of the university, um, his name was Patrick Hughes Mel. He met the protesters and he demanded that they, they dispersed. He threatened them saying, not one of you will leave this campus alive if they did not stand down and did not end their protest for the day. So this did cause the uh, Athenians to protesters to stand down. And this happened in 1866, so we wouldn't see the integration of the University of Georgia for about another hundred years almost. Has anyone here seen any protest recently that they've seen take place in front of the arch? Mm -hmm. Yeah, so you probably saw a lot during the summer of 2020. There was a very prominent um, protest for Black for the Black Lives Matter movement that occurred right across from the arch where there was actually a former Confederate monument that was taken down during in response to the action and movement of these groups during the summer of 2020. And, you know, groups like that still come and protest in front of the university demanding for equality and to fight injustices that are faced in our community. And so hopefully the arch will continue to be a place where students and groups representing all different causes can always have a space to have their voices be heard and to fight for the three pillars that our university stands for, wisdom, justice, and moderation. And hopefully the, we can continue to see improvement and progress here through the protests at the Arch and they can continue to progress our university and make it an even better environment than what it is right now. So as we're going to walk down our next 
site is the Hunter Homes Academic Building. So has anyone heard of Charlene Hunter or Hamilton Homes? All right, so yeah, Charlene Hunter and Hamilton Homes were the first two African-American students to enter right, the University of Georgia. Now, of course, this is a very long, hard, difficult process. The integration at the university was not easy. It did not come quick. As we saw in our last, as we talked about in our last site, we had Black Athenians demanding integration back in 1866. And here we are talking about two students who didn't start their courses at the university till 1961. So that is a very long time period. That's about 95 years, if I'm doing my math correctly. Um, this building right here used to be two separate Anna Antebellum buildings. It was the Ivy Building and the Library. Both, we can presume, were constructed with the use of enslaved labor, as that's how most labor during the Antebellum period was um, sourced from. And the buildings were combined... And I will look up when they were combined and have that for blah, blah, blah. Um, once the building and now the building is just one big building and it is our academic building. So this building in 1961 is where um, Hamilton and home, sorry, where Hamilton Holmes and Charlene Hunter um, registered for the first classes. Now, to get to their registration, does anyone know what the Brown v. Board of Education Supreme Court ruling case was. All right, so yes, this case overturned the law of separate but equal, so saying that it was no longer legal to separate races for schools and, and other public establishments. So you could no longer deny um, African Americans admittance into a college based on their race. That was no longer allowed and that was illegal. And actually, Holmes and Hunter were not our first African-American students to apply to the university. Horace T. Ward actually applied to UGA's law school in 1950, which is four years prior to the Brown v. Ward decision, which took place in 1954. Um, Ward was applying to the law school and he actually applied for six years, but he was denied admission every single one of those years. and. Eventually, it seems that he gave up, but luckily, Charlene Hunter and Hamilton Holmes, they applied for admission in 1959, and they were denied admission originally, but they took their um, case to court, and they sued the university, which then f the courts forced um, UGA to admit um, Holmes and Hunter, and they began classes in January of 1961. Now, of course, this process was not smooth because we are living in the Jim Crow, post Jim Crow South. It's still hate groups and everything are very rampant during this time. And most white students and white town and white Athenians and Georgians period were just not ready for this integration to take place. So unfortunately, rioters, um, met Charlene Hunter in front of her dormitory, where she was in Myers. She used to live in um, Myers dorm, which is on South Campus. And luckily, the Athens police force mobilized and they confronted the rioters and got them to disperse with tear gas. So Hunter wasn't harmed in the riot, but her and Holmes did um, withdraw from school for about a week just to make sure that they were safe and protected and that they would be able to attend classes without being harmed. They did um, come back to campus a week later and they eventually finished out their degrees in 1963 and have had amazing careers. Um, Hunter has has become became an award-winning journalist. She has won two um, Peabody Award. She has won two um, National News and Documentary Emmy Awards. So she's done amazing things with her career, as well as 
and then Holmes went to, he was the first African American student to go to Emory University School of Medicine and he became a head orthopedic surgeon at Grady Hospital. So they've both had, they both had fantastic careers and made great impacts and were trailblazers just in their careers alone, as well as being trailblazers at the university. Now, Hunter and Holmes are actually not the first African American students to actually graduate from the school as um, Mary Frances Early, who our College of Education is named after, she graduated from UGA and a year before them in 1962. And she has had an amazing career in music education in Georgia schools and public schools. And this just shows like, Education is such a massively important things and having these amazing figures to look forward to and have broken bar barriers in the university has just really helped create a much better and progressive environment in our university and has really helped the university grow and become even better. Now we're gonna move on to our third site and we are here at our main library. This is where a lot of the students do are studying and everything. And we're going to talk about Lucius Henry Holsey, who was an extremely important figure in education for the University of Georgia. Has anyone heard of, heard of Lucius Henry Holsey before? All right, no. I mean, before this, I had not heard about him either, which is really a shame because he is a fantastic guy. He's amazing. So, um, Lucius Henry Holsey, the reason why he's associated with the University of Georgia is not fantastic. It's not great at all. He was born in Columbus, Georgia in 1862, in 1842, and he was born to, his mother was a slave, and his father was um, his mother's master, James Holsey. And so he was born into enslavement. And when his father, um, also his master, <coughs> died, he was then given as property to his master's cousin. And his cousin soon died after that. And before he passed, he asked um, Holsey to choose between two of his two of his master's friends to be his next owner which that that sounds terrible and very that's a very um disgusting situation um and Holsey chose to go live and work for um Richard Malcolm Johnston who was a planter and he had just become a professor of English here at UGA so when Johnston came to the University of Georgia Holsey came with him and while in Athens, Holsey converted to Method Methodism. He became very involved in religious and religion and very involved in the churches in the area. Um, during this time, it was also, um, he took the risk of teaching himself to read, which does anyone know why him learning to read is significant? Okay, yeah, it's because during this time, it was illegal for African Americans to be literate. They were not allowed to learn how to read. They were not allowed to be educated at this time. And which was mainly used because in order to help prevent um, African Americans from being able to vote, they would have literacy tests that you'd have to take at the polls and you had to be able to pass these literacy tests. And obviously, if you're making it illegal for African Americans to learn how to read and learn how to write, then they would not be able to pass these literally literacy tests at the polls, which means they couldn't vote. And the white men maintained their power in politics. And now, um, Holsey's dedication to his Christian faith and education were very important in his life. These were his top priorities. And he became a leader who fought for education and wanted to uplift um, his fellow African Americans and his community. Holsey was actually one of the um, main advocates for harmony between white and black people during this time. He had a really good friendship with George Pierce, who was a Methodist. Um, he was a Methodist bishop who had been um, president of 
Wesleyan and Emory Colleges in Georgia. And their friendship was very notable because they both wanted to work to have their, their relationship was representative of the ideals that they both had and they wanted harmony between the two communities. But of course, after many years of Halsey living in the Jim Crow South and him ex experiencing constant discrimination and constant racism and after a series of terrible lynchings in the 1890s, he shifted his views and he no longer was calling for white and black harmony. He wanted a separate U.S. state for black Americans to live in. He... Uh, in his pursuit to really um, value education and promote education in the African-American community, he um, fundraised all around the South and through donations, pennies, donations of pennies from former slaves and different church leaders who were able to give him a little bit more. He founded um, Payne College in Augusta University, which is a historically um, black College and University down in Augusta, Georgia, and this was just really important in solidifying the importance of education and how everyone deserved access to a high level of education. Now, what can we say that we've learned about this? How has the value for education how has the value for education become important in creating change in our world, in our society today? Yeah, so like with education, it's really important and it kind of shapes, it allows everyone to have a voice and the more educated you are on certain topics, the more you can advocate for change and make and continue to progress society. And then what can we really learn from Henry's life? Mm -hmm. Yeah, Lucius Henry Holsey is an extremely inspirational figure as he was told that he was born into slavery and he was told that he was not allowed to read, he was not allowed to write and he took the opportunity he had while staying in Athens and he made sure that he learned how to read and write and he went out of his way and he bought books and he took his life and his education into his own hands which is so inspiring because he decided that he wasn't going to let society dictate what he could and couldn't accomplish with his life. He had big goals and aspirations not only for himself but all of the african-american community and he wanted to show everyone that it was possible and that they could break through these barriers and these walls that people had set for them now of course this doesn't mean that just because one person was able to do it that means it was easy for everyone no there are circumstances that made it to where not he was lucky that he was able to get access to these books and he was able to read and travel around and and earn this money and then to found a college like he was extremely lucky in that in that um segment but what his what he was able to accomplish in his life speaks absolute volumes especially for the time and he is a great inspiration for education i'm really prioritizing education and he's a symbol for it if you want to learn about something if you want to do something like you can do it and you can like just put your mind to it everything will be great sorry that was terrible yay all right so our fourth stop today is here baldwin hall now has anyone heard about the recent controversy surrounding baldwin hall and this memorial that we are standing around today And then also, can I ask you, what do you guys think this memorial is here is symbolizing? Like, what do we, what is this memorial, what is it, what do you think it stands for just from looking at it? All right, so a few years ago, grave sites from before the Civil War were uncovered during the renovations of Baldwin Hall. And the university did know 
about f almost 40 years prior to this that Baldwin Hall was sitting on top of buried bodies and that um, the old Athens Cemetery was underneath um, Baldwin Hall. It had Baldwin Hall was built on top of the um, black side of the cemetery. So when these bones were uncovered, it was found that um, the remains belonged most likely to enslaved people. And this was not the first time that graves of enslaved people were discovered here, actually. In the early 1900s, bodies were also found during construction around Baldwin Hall. And it is very likely that there are more undiscovered graves around this building. Now, when the university found these bones, they decided to um, handle the situation very poorly. They wanted to keep it very quiet. They didn't want to talk and get the input of the community around them and talk, talk with locals. They just wanted to quickly transport the remains and rebury them at a Coney Hill Cemetery, which is just up the street from us. And this really upset a lot of students and a lot of um, local Athenians as they felt like they had the right to have a say in what should have been done with these remains and what should have been done to respect these remains as this building was built on top of the gravestones of people which is very disrespectful. Um, the university has received a ton of backlash over the way they handled this and really their lack of ability to own up to the situation and talk about what this means. Finding these um, grape sites really brought up the re brought up the conversation of the university and its history of slavery and that realistically the university was probably built using enslaved labor and that UGA has played a part in the enslavement of African Americans. Now just a few months ago there, this um, memorial that we're standing in front of was revealed and it was meant to honor the dead that were found um, in Baldwin Hall. And this memorial was very upsetting to the locals and students as we've talked about since the university did not really consult anyone in their doing of this. It was all a very rushed process. They wanted to just quickly move the bones, move move the bones, rebury them, and construct a memorial in hopes of making sure that, in hopes of trying to get through all this um, without criticism, to avoid criticism. So after you hear about how the university handled this situation, what do you think the university should have done to handle this situation? What could they have done better if you think they could have done something better? Yes, like the university 1000% should have spent the time to talk about, to talk with students and talk about, talk with local Athenians about what they felt was the right move to honor these, um, to honor the people that they, um, to honor the remains that they dug up as it is a very, I mean, it's a very difficult conversation but it's definitely a necessary conversation and it's important for the university to own up to its history with slavery and it's unavoidable and it would look I would say it would probably look a lot better if the university was more open and honest and if with um how they handled the situation and got more input let's say when they were building the memorial um, how do you think the university and local community going forward should work together to preserve history? Yes, they should definitely, it should be more collaborative. The university shouldn't just take everything into their own hands. They should talk to other historians. They should talk to the locals. They should talk to students. They should talk to different experts on the matter. If there are a family lineage that they can pass to different um, historical events, obviously something like this, they probably couldn't have done that, but other historical events and talk to maybe um, family members who are still alive or anything like that and really get 
and input from the overall community would probably be a better scenario than to just rushing through something quickly and hopes that they can absolve themselves from any um, conflict and avoid further conflict down the road. All right, now our fifth site. We are here in front of Peabody Hall. Has anyone ever heard of Peabody Hall before? Has anyone ever been here? No? All right, that's fine. I did not expect any of you to have been here anyways. Has anyone heard of Governor Eugene Talmadge before? All right, that's fine. Perfect, we're gonna learn about him today. All right, so this is Peabody Hall that we're standing in front of. It is the former building for that house, the College of Education, back in the um, early um, 1900s and before then. Um, in the early 1940s, there was a major public disaster for UGA when all white colleges and the University System of Georgia lost their accreditation. Now this sounds pretty dramatic. It's losing accreditation means degrees no longer mean anything for students, so there's basically no point to them attending the school if their degree does not mean anything. And so you may be wondering, what event transpired that could have led to the universities losing their accreditation? Well, I'm going to tell you. So, the controversy began when the governor of Georgia, Eugene Talmadge, fired our dean of college, uh, dean of the College of Education, Walter Duby Cocking. He accused him of wanting to integrate the school. Now, in reality, Cocking was arguing for um, equal funding be dispersed to black universities and saying that they deserve to have um, in same quality of education. He was not um, advocating for the university to be integrated. He just said that black colleges and universities deserve equal funding, which he's correct. And Talmadge saw this as a threat to the university and interpreted this as Cocking wanting to integrate the university. Now, Talmadge was, during this time, Eugene Talmadge was serving his third term as governor, and he was an extremely significant figure in Georgia history because of how openly racist his opinions were and how influential his political career was. Now, he, where the um, loss of accreditation comes in, is when, in reaction to Talmadge wanting to um having Cocking fired the um president of the university at the time Harmon Caldwell threatened to resign if um Talmadge had Cocking um fired and this case then was brought to a public hearing in Atlanta before the board of regents which um if you don't know this is a committee that's appointed by um the governor to govern and oversee the university systems and there were also several faculty members that advocated for dean cocking and the board of regents was convinced and they decided to reinstate cocking because they really didn't think he did anything wrong that deserved him to be fired now this was extremely um upsetting to governor talmadge as he felt that he had been betrayed by this and he didn't want to risk um basically he didn't want to risk um he didn't like the idea of racial equality and he didn't want to risk those ideas and principles coming to the university of georgia and so in result and so and um what i want to say to retaliate against the board of regents reinstating caulking he decided, Talmadge decided to um, replace the members of the Board of Regents who voted to reinstate caulking, and he replaced them with people who would vote the way that Talmadge wanted them to vote. And so then this new board then removed caulking and other prominent educators throughout the state of Georgia and all the different colleges who seemed to challenge the ideals of white supremacy. So if you had any 
if you spoke at all about um, the desire for racial equality and um, black students deserving maybe the right to go to predominantly white colleges or just simply what Carking did, these black colleges receive equal funding, Talmadge wanted you out. And eventually, the um, Southern Association of Colleges and Schools, which oversees all state universities in the South, revoked UGA's accreditation, which caused all students their degrees meant nothing because they saw Talmadge as he was interfering with education for political gains and political means. And for the Southern Association of Colleges and Schools, that is a big no, no, you cannot interfere in education for political gains and to um, promote a political agenda. That is just not allowed. And that's exactly what Talmadge did. He wasn't doing it for the betterment of the schools. He was doing it to promote his own personal agenda. And this law and UG's loss of accreditation led to massive protests across campus. Students were, are, were understandably very upset that their um, degrees no longer meant anything. A lot of Georgians were very upset about this because the University of Georgia is a massive school um, in the state and it's really representative of the state. So this what affected a ton of people because um, a lot of people obviously care about the university. And this led to so many protests. People were furious with Talmadge and students demanded that Talmadge reverse what he did, that they, that he um, reinstates the board members, that he reinstates caulking, and to get to where the Southern Association of Colleges and Schools would get the university their accreditation back. He refused to do anything about it, which basically then led Talmadge to be defeated in the next governor's race because he had lost all support from the students and the students at the university, that is a ton of people. That is a big majority of your voting base. And think about their parents, think about people who went to the university. That is a lot of people. He alienated himself. Not a good idea. And while at first glance, it is easy to look at the story and be like, wow, the students really stood up for white supremacy in this moment. Let me ask you before we talk about this. Do you guys think the students were standing against white supremacy in this moment? Or do you think they were more upset about their degrees becoming meaningless? Mm -hmm. Yeah, most likely the students were just upset that their degrees became meaningless. They, in and, and a red and black article, they wrote the dean saying that they did not care. They were not trying to promote ideals of racial equality across campus, that none of them harbor those feelings of wanting racial equality. And they were upset that the governor felt like they um, were fighting for these principles when they were not. And really, they just wanted their degrees read. And they wanted to make sure that the university regained accreditation so that their degrees would actually mean something. So now that we've reflected on this event that happened in, 19, in the early 1940s, what kind of effects do we see politics have having on education today like if have any of you guys been paying attention to the news is there anything that you've noticed where politics and education have been kind of colliding mm -hmm. yeah especially with the ideas of critical race theory there's been a lot of um bills being passed in our georgia legislation or um being um talked about being um written in our legislation talking about what they want what they um want teachers to be limited on what they can talk about regarding racial issues and so ideas like this where we have politicians trying to decide what can and can't be discussed in schools is still a very prominent issue that we see today and it's really dangerous when these politicians are getting involved and mingling with our um, education it's a really really scary thing All right, now let's move on to our sixth and final site of the day. Here we are at our two literary societies. We have Phi Kappa and the Desmostian. I need to practice how to say that. The Desmostian Society. Um, has anyone heard of these societies before or know what they are? No? 
perfectly fine. I did not know what they were either. They are our literary societies here at the University of Georgia, and they are the oldest student organizations at UGA. Um, these societies were formed um, very early on in UGA's history, nearly 200 years ago, and they were formed for students to practice um, their debate skills and to have, um, which means like the students would um, practice methods for speaking publicly and arguing, and arguing as effectively as possible with people who held opposing views. So it was just a, they were just spaces created for students to talk about different issues and practice their ability to speak publicly about um, and argue on the different sides of different current issues at that time. Um, now let me ask you guys, like, why do you guys think debate is so important? Why do you think these societies were created? Yeah, I mean, it's a very important skill to be able to debate a topic with someone, to be able to list this, list why you think something and be able to provide evidence and stand up for that point of why you do. And that's, I mean, it's a very important skill to have. It's a important skill to have no matter like what your career is to be able to take a stance and be able to defend that stance. Very important. And you'll see that as you um, continue to progress in your education. And these, what's really, what was kind of important about the societies is these were one of the very few spaces in the deep south um, where slavery and slavery and abolition could be openly talked about and debated. Now, were these debates necessarily the most serious debates? Were the topics of slavery and ideas of abolition really necessarily taken seriously by these people? Most likely not, because it is important to note that these societies, these societies were originally exclusive to only white male students. So, in any of the discussions, you were getting one perspective and one perspective only. So, most likely, in the very early history of the UGA in the 1700s and 1800s, you were not getting a serious debate about whether or not they believed slavery should be um, illegal or should be put to an end. Now, these societies, um, so as I've said, both women and African Americans were originally barred from participating in these societies, and the Demosthenian society was rigidly opposed to desegregation, and but they were sometimes met with very violent backlash. They even um, held, the society held organized protests, organized riots, against desegregation and it was not until 1964 which is a year after um, Hunter and Holmes graduated from the university that the Demosthenian Society voted to allow members of all races to join the literary society and it wasn't until about 50 years later in 19 um, that's not correct math it wasn't until about 30 years later, in 1996, when Phi Kappa swore its first black president, um, his name, they called each other brother and sister in there, so he was referred to as brother Jeffrey O'Neill Monroe, and Monroe was a student here at the University of Georgia. He received a law degree while studying here, and he is now currently a state court judge in Bibb County. And if you were to go into the building, his portrait hangs in um, Phi Kappa. And then just a few years ago, so more recently, um, the Desmosthenian Society swore in its first black woman president into the society, which is a huge and it shows progress within these societies. Now, these both societies have really worked to make improvements within the society and have worked to recognize the racist um, history and past that the societies have. In um, 2017, after the Unite the Right rally, which happened in Charlottesville, Virginia, the Desmosthenian Society voted unanimously to remove a portrait of Robert E. Lee, who was, um, if you guys don't know, he was a Civil War 
general for the Confederate Army, and his portrait used to hang in their building, and so they voted unanimously to have that portrait removed, and so he no longer um, has a picture that hangs in that building, which 2017, that's very recent. Very recent, that's five years ago. Anyways, and then they also, last year, they debated the Confederate Monument, which used to be on Broad Street, as we talked about when we were standing over by the arch. It was right across from the arch, and that has since been removed. And both of these societies have written letters, and they have made pledges that they will continue to improve their societies, and they will continue to fight for change within the university and progress and own up to their racist past and vow to make improvements. Um, Phi Kappa actually has a competition every single year where members um, present speeches on predetermined topics and it used to be named the Stevens. Um, hold on, I have this note somewhere. This is going to take a second. Ignore that. I'll have this written down. Do, do, do. Um, the Stevens Declamation, and this, and he was a, um, Alexander Stevens was a, um, Phi Kappa alum, and he was also the former vice president of the Confederate States of America. So, the Phi Kappa Society decided in 2019 that they were going to rename this event, and it was going to be named the Phi Kappa Declamation, so that they could remove themselves from um, the racist past that's been associated with the society, which shows that even if it's a small change, they are wanting to make change and progress and progress their societies. And they um, have released statements saying that they recognize the mistakes of the past and they want to um, make sure that those mistakes are fixed and that they do whatever they can to right the wrongs and continue continue to fight and make sure that things like this don't happen again and that they continue the societies continue to progress and be a place of debate and or debate a place of debate and academic discussion and now like after we've talked about the debates that they've had so they debated um and the very early years, they debated the um, whether or not slavery should be illegal. They debated um, Confederate monuments more recently. What type of debates do you think the, like you would like these societies to have? Like, what topics do you think would be interesting to hear these societies debate on? Or what topics do you think these societies need to debate on? Because they're just that important. Okay, they'll share their things. Mm -hmm. Yeah, there's just some great ideas. And this university really has some, uh, has a really rich history and it's a very complicated history, but that's what history is. History is extremely complicated. And while talking about some things may make us slightly uncomfortable, they may be a little hard to talk about, a little difficult to talk about, but that's what history is. History is difficult. But if we're not uncomfortable when talking about history and if it's not difficult, then we're not changing and we're not growing. In order to grow and become the best versions of ourselves and a better society, we have to be uncomfortable. Because if you're not uncomfortable, you're not willing to grow and you're not willing to change. And so, I really hope you guys have enjoyed what we've talked about today and enjoyed. And um, I hope you guys really take something from what we've talked about today. And that uh, we now see that the university is really dedicated to the ideals of diversity and inclusion. And they really have a strong emphasis on progress. And if we see the university maybe slipping on these things as students, as community members, we need to make sure that they are upholding these values that they are um, pledging to, pledging their commitment to. And we have to take it into our own hands hands and make sure that the community around us in the university is growing with the community around us and really progressing with the world around us and anyways i really enjoyed talking to you guys today and i hope you have enjoyed this bye